Hi guys, welcome to the 19th I Measure You Research Review. This week we are pleased to be joined by Neil Welsh from Sports Surgery Clinic in, in Dublin. Neil, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? No worries. Um, yeah, doing well. Pleasure to join you on the 19th uh, version of your research review. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Neil, we'll, we'll dive straight in. So, I mean, for those of you who don't know um, much about you, if you could start off by telling us a little bit more about who you are, um, what you actually do at Sports Surgery Clinic and, and how you've got to, to where you are today. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so my name is uh, Neil Welch. Um, my current role at the Sports Surgery Clinic is as head of um, our lab services, so head of the SSC lab. Um, my background is as a strength and conditioning coach, um, and that's how I, how I trained. Um, so I did an undergrad in Leeds University uh, longer ago than I, I care, to, uh, care to remember. Um, uh, did a master's on top of that through the University of Bolton um, and then through various uh, various roles about seven years ago um, moved over to Dublin to to be the first strength and conditioning coach in through the door here in um, in the sports surgery clinic um, so I guess the the lucky guy to get the um, uh, the first the first job here so um, which was like a really interesting experience for me so um, as a strength and conditioning coach, you're uh, geared more towards uh, performance setting. Um, and then all of a sudden to have these kind of injured patients, like I, I'd have seen a lot of patients with low back pain uh, early on. Um, but then all of a sudden you have these, what in your head is a, is a very kind of fragile patient coming in the door. And it's more your nervousness that you have to, to worry about rather than the robustness of the, of the patient coming in. Um, so there's a bit of a learning curve involved with that, but what we found gradually is that there's a massive role for, for strength training and rehabilitation across a really broad range of the, of the population. Um, now, when I moved over, part of the, the role was, was going to be a split, a split role with the PhD. Um, so over the course of uh, about five and a half years, I think it took in the end, um, I, I completed my PhD, uh, looking at the role of strength, power, reactive strength in rehabilitation and performance. Um, which is very broad spread, but the, the reason for that was the, um, the broad nature of the role here and the, to try and, I guess, shoehorn in as, as much of the, um, the population that we see here as possible. So the, the first part of that study, or the PhD, was around low back pain, and then to try and create a link in, in towards uh, groin pain and introduce change direction, which is where my, my real interest lies. Uh, and then finally looking at um, the role of um, or kinematic, kinematic and kinetic factors in, in change direction performance. Um, so I finished that, finished that last year, uh, thankfully. Um, you know, that little gray rain cloud sat on top of the head for five and a half years has, has, has now disappeared, um, uh, which allows me just a little bit more, um, a little bit more time, more so out, outside the clinic than, than anything else. Is that there's quite a large undertaking with, with doing a PhD in, and trying to fit it alongside a, a full-time role, um, I think is um, uh, just requires a little bit of um, a little bit of sacrifice out of the side as well. So, awesome, Neil. So you mentioned that you're the head of the lab services. One thing I want to touch on is some of the research that might be coming into the lab slash out of the lab at the moment. So, what are you involved in now? Is there any change of direction uh, studies going on now, or what are you guys currently looking at? Obviously, independent of COVID, you know, if you when you get your populations in again. Yeah, 100%. So um, the, the lab services were, were kind of born uh, about eight, eight or nine years ago now um, with the start of our groin research and, and ACL research. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to, to be able to build a, a pathway around that. So, so essentially, if you come into the clinic and you have athletic groin pain, you're going to get some 3D biomechanical testing um, to help guide your rehabilitation. Uh, similarly with our with our ACLs, um, if you have uh, an ACL re reconstruction here, and we do about a thousand of them a year, um, then you're you're going to come in for, for our testing services. At, currently, it's three, six, and nine months, but we're going to we're going to change um, soon to, to two tests at four and, and seven months. So we've we've been able to um, I guess run a, a 3D biomechanics lab commercially. Uh, which enabled us to, to capture a lot of information. Now, you, you spoke to Engler a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, his PhD was around that um, ACL re rehabilitation and the, um, uh, the, the factors kind of relate to, to re-ruptures. Um, so 
like off of the back of that, we've been able to, to find out some of the factors that are key for ACL rehabilitation. And um, we have a, a relatively low injury risk for those who uh, come through the program as regards second injury. Um, so the idea now is to try and roll that out across um, multiple uh, body parts, essentially. Um, so we have a PhD ongoing in shoulder to look at return to play uh, testing post uh, shoulder surgery. Um, we have an Achilles study ongoing. Uh, we have a PhD just starting in, uh, in and around low back pain. Um, and then hopefully we're looking to roll something out more around um, uh, hip replacements and uh, knee replacements. So it's, it's, it's to try and broaden the spectrum. Now, now within that, we all have our own kind of research interests. Um, so because we're gathering data um, as, as an ongoing basis, we're able to kind of um, almost jump in and ask our own research questions. Um, which is, uh, given my role currently, is, um, is one of the more exciting things for me. Um, so rather than necessarily now after the PhD, um, having to have this kind of strict structure um, is we can start delving in and having a little look at, say, some of the, um, uh, some of the factors that, that relate to um, performance in change direction in ACLs, for example. Um, so you mentioned about change direction in, um, uh, in your question, James. So... Uh, I think one of the things we talk about, and again, we're fortunate here that every patient comes through for 3D analysis, that we, we talk them through the, the, the technical factors that relate to their cutting uh, and some of the things they might want to change in order to reduce injury risk. So, for example, we, we go through, we, we might see someone performing a 93 cut and, and have some contralateral trunk sway. Now, we know that's going to increase knee loading um, and knee rotational uh, loading and, and be a risk factor. Um, so we're talking through maybe some of the things from a coaching perspective that we would like to, to see change um, and, and go through some, some, some coaching sessions with them. Now, what I'd quite like to be able to do is to, to look at, say, some of those coaching factors that we change and see how that impacts their performance and also the, the biomechanics of the, of the movements. Because some of the things we talk about, we, we kind of think we're along the right lines from a coaching perspective. We don't necessarily have the numbers to, to back that up. So, so if I ask someone to approach a change direction um, in a slightly lower center of mass position, you know, what does that do to knee loading? I think it reduces it. I think it places them at lower risk as they, they hit the plate with more knee flexion. Um, they're, they're going to experience less contralateral trunk sway as a result. They don't know that for sure. Um, and be good to then be able to back up the, one of the coaching interventions, but then to, to put some, some kind of numerical on well, actually, this is a really big factor for you because you're in the top 5% of the most upright people who approach a, a change direction versus actually you're dropping your central mass 50% of your, of your, body, of your um, resting or standing body height. So therefore, um, you're in the, the safer zone as you can be for, uh, in that regard. So, so it's more to just understand and, and learn a little bit more about the biomechanics and, and how that might impact, um, say, some of the, the injury factors. Now, that's, that's really interesting. And um, I mean, I've been over to, to sports surgery clinic on a couple of occasions, and I know that your, your, your setup and your, your process, your procedure to, to put your, your populations through this kind of, um, the, the whole process is, is, is really, really seamless and, and it works really well for you guys. Um, obviously, the, the age old argument, Neil, is how um, easy is it to replicate the stuff in the lab in the field um how i mean where do you see the the industry going in that respect do you have any kind of desires or do you have the ability to conduct any in-field research over in dublin um not as it stands um and, it's, and that's the thing there's always a bit of a, a bit of a leap between testing something within the lab because there's the certain constraints you need in order to be able to do research so it needs to be re reproducible. You can't necessarily be testing completely different change direction movements with, with everyone who comes in. So obviously there's constraints there. Um, we know as well, like we use an indecision cut where we're responding to timing gates and to, uh, sorry, to, uh, to lighting systems. Um, and we know there's a bit of a difference between scanning a field to be able to see a, a green light going off in a corner versus two players running at me and me having to make a decision on whether I go for the, for the ball or not. Um, but I think broadly, this, the same biomechanical factors impact both. So, so for me, it would be learning what are the more important biomechanical factors that, you know, Franz Bosch should talk about his attractor states. So like, th there must be broad um, biomechanical cues that we can give to our athletes that, that lower risk and develop, it, develop performance. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think for me, it's learning what those are in the lab. 
um, or, or not, or, or on pitch, but, but either way, learning what they are and then finding some way to measure that on pitch. So you can determine, for example, um, you know, with ACL being a, the largest time loss injury that you're going to get, are any of your athletes more at risk than others? So we can say, use some, like it, obviously you guys um, in, the, in the realm of inertial sensors there, they were able to use some form of technology to determine whether or not they're um, safe in this variable or slightly higher risk. And then you can target a coaching intervention on them and then you can see whether or not they change it. So I'd, I'd say it's, it's, it's more that, it's, it's being able to understand whether your um, coaching interventions work um, and then also whether the, the key factors that um, have been, you know, you've decided upon or, or you, you found are actually present within your, within your squad. If you measure it and they're not, they're grand, then, then you're, you know, you're happy, you've got less work to do and you can kind of focus on another area. And I think that's one of the other important things for, um, like we, we would call it profiling our athletes when they come in, is it just starts to help shape your prioritization. So again, if, if you're able to take a group of athletes, and I, I know with I measure you, you guys are looking at, at distance running, and, and just identify the guys who might need to do a bit of work on this stuff. And then you, you save yourself a whole bunch of time. So instead of maybe everybody doing, um, I don't know, a million ankle dribbles at the beginning of their warm-ups every single session on pitch, well, you might say that you might target that towards a group of four or five guys with slightly higher risk based on the information that you're given and look at their change over time. Whereas the group, the, the bulk of the squad might be fine and then you can focus on something else in the warm-up. So for me, it's to, to avoid the broad brush approach and to try and be able to be a little bit more targeted with each individual athlete. I, you know, within S&C, we talk a lot about individualization of training, but, you know, how much of that happens outside of different weights on the bar? You know, like we're not necessarily targeting completely different interventions across a whole squad, which is, is challenging to do. But at least if you've got some metrics to back it up, it's an easy sell for the athlete then and then for you as a coach. Great. Neil, that very, you mentioned a couple of interesting things there. The one thing I want to touch on, and please don't be shy to bat this question away either, is, so you mentioned you, you're looking at certain populations and try to figure out if certain movements in the, in the top or bottom 5% or whatever the case is. So two-fold question here. Are you using just the data within your lab, or are you looking at data, worldwide data, because some of that's freely accessible, not all? And with that, is there any deep learning or machine learning that you guys are looking into at the moment? Because I know a lot of guys in the biomechanics space, you know, are moving towards that machine learning approach, you know, in a number of uh, methods? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll play it with a straight back, Jim. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> uh, um, no, 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 not at all. Like we, um, uh, we're not accessing any other uh, broader databases at the moment. So we've got a relatively large database of ACL um, injured athletes um, and re uh, rehabilitating athletes that we, we have access to. Um, so there isn't necessarily the one, the necessity just at the moment, but also time. Um, you know, there's a, there's a finite amount of resources um, for, for ourselves within the clinic um, in terms of doing our own research. Um, so like, while it'd be nice to be able to, to jump into some of those other, other databases, although we, we have collaborated with, um, uh, with the Norwe Norwegian group looking at some of their data as well. So we, we do have smaller collaborations ongoing. Um, so we're not, we're not adverse to it. Um, but equally, we, we recognize the importance of, well, one, we're a commercial entity, so we have to see patients and, and bring in revenue. Um, and we, but we recognize the importance of building, building relationships. But one thing we've, we've worked quite hard here to do is, is, is kind of learn to say no to certain things that maybe aren't the, the highest priority for us. So we don't, we don't kind of spread ourselves too thin. Um, is to try and, like, if we're, if we're focusing on one project that, we're, um, that we go all in on it, find out if it works. If not, we move, we move in another direction. And that's, a, again, another nice thing about working here is we're relatively agile in our approach. So we, uh, because we're smallish, um, we, we can kind of make decisions and, 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 and ex uh, experiment with different avenues. Um, as regards the, the machine learning side of things, yeah. Um, so our head of uh, data and, and innovation, um, it'd be a much better place to answer any of the technical questions you might have, James. So, so definitely don't follow this up with a, um, <laughs> uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the techniques we're employing. Um, but yeah, like, again, we, we, we're applying machine learning techniques to be able to try and understand um, whether there's, there's some factors or um, uh, groups of factors and variables that, um, that are related to, to re-injury in particular. 
Um, I don't I think that the trick with some of this stuff as well, like you guys know your way around biomechanics. So you, so you know how, um, how many, one, how many variables and data points there are that you can access. Um, but then, then two, when you start looking at them, like how meaningful are they? So if we're, if we're looking at say, um, uh, knee rotation moments, um, or joint powers or joint accelerations, you know, what does that mean to me as a coach? You know, how, how do I talk to an athlete about the knee flexion acceleration, um, and implement a, a, a um, uh, a strategy in order to be able to, to try and change that. It's quite, it's quite difficult. So, so I think it, it's important that, um, and again, we're, we're relatively fortunate here that we've got a, a good clinical mix, that the, the, there's a clinical side or a coaching side to the application of that machine learning side of things. So that we end up with something that isn't, okay, well, we've got these numbers which look really good, but actually, how do I actually, like, there's no way of implementing that as a, as a coach if you can't, one, wrap your head around what those variables mean. Um, uh, but, but to implement some sort of strategy to, to try and change it. No, that's awesome. Um, and just, I mean, with, with everything that, that's going on currently at um, SSC, Neil, I mean, where do you see, um, the, where do you see the future going? What, what, do you, what do you think will be possible in, in six months, 12 months, two years time? What do you hope to achieve? Yeah, well, obviously we've got, um, commercial services that we want to uh, that we want to push um, uh, and apply the same th same sort of things we've done with uh, ACL. So we've gotten to a stage where, um, like, people who come in for surgery at the sports surgery clinic um, seem to have a lower risk of re-injury. In part, we think that's because of the uh, the information we're able to give patients and, and help give them some direction on their rehabilitation. Um, we'd like to see the same apply across shoulder um, and say joint and, and knee replacements so so rolling out those services and, and setting up some research programs around those to try and determine what factors are going to result in improved outcomes is, is important for us um, the, the other side for me is that the majority of um, uh, of research within sports science looks at comparing one group with another group or applying an intervention to a group as a whole seeing whether that intervention is effective and making a decision on that intervention. And that helps to, to guide practice. Um, however, like that's, that's not how it, like it kind of exists in the real world. So if, if I take say a, um, we'll, we'll use back pain as an example. So I have, a, I have a back pain patient in and just purely thinking about more the mechanical and strength side of things here without getting into a big psychosocial conversation. But um, I, might have, I might have one patient that is, um, uh, weaker in say um, the anterior hip I might have a patient who is good in the anterior hip but weak in hip extension I might have another patient who is good in both of those but is weak um, in their lumbar extensors right, but then I apply a hip extension program to those guys and I reach a finding that actually hip extension programs aren't useful in helping people low back pain Whereas they're useful in helping, the, like really useful in helping the person who's got big hip extension. So I, I think where we're going to we're going to move towards and, and hopefully get a little bit better at is understanding the role of personalised prescription for, for rehabilitation. It's finding out like what levels are good and good enough, and where does that each individual deviate, and are rehabilitation interventions better when they are personalised in that way. Um, I, it's actually quite interesting. We've got a, I've got a paper in review at the minute, just um, uh, going through a, a series of five athletes with athletic groin pain, and, and just showing the the individual variety that exists across a lot of even just the, the basic strength measures, and how like you, applying the, a single intervention to all of those guys, you know, it's it actually ends up if you apply a single intervention based on the mean, it's not applicable to to any of the guys. Um, but the just delving into a little bit of st statistics behind it, a lot of that kind of group versus group analysis, um, it, it was developed to look at crop yields, you know, where like you want to have a look at, you know, the, the mean of one field versus the mean of the field, the other fields, because that results in more grain. So we, what we've done is we've taken a lot of these statistical tests and we kind of put them into sports science and, you know, we apply the mean of this group versus the mean of this group. But, you know, how much does that tell us about the, the individual? 
and that helps to shape some of the landscape I think in in rehabilitation and, and sports science and even kind of coaching practice because some of the findings from research we look at and we, we try and apply it to um, uh, to the group that we have in front of us whereas actually you know that um, that intervention might not be effective for for a large chunk of the individuals that you are coaching so um, I think that's what we're that's what we're looking towards so a combination of you know the, the a broader um, set of services implementing the, the biomechanics that we rely quite heavily on here. Um, and then also to be a little bit um, more accurate in our um, prescription and, and personalization of rehab. That Great. Neil, so I mean, there's no, you know, don't worry, there's no follow-up questions to the machine learning stuff um, <laughs> on my end. It's, uh, there's so no more. To start Googling there, Jim. <laughs> Good. Um, so uh, there's no more questions per se from my side. I'm mean, still Dan Thunder, but because this is his question pretty much every week, I've noticed a little trend. But Neil, so if anyone wants to get hold of you, what's the best way? Twitter, LinkedIn, email, where can they get in touch with you? You know, where, if they have any questions regarding SSC or anything else? Yeah, sure. Um, so Twitter's fine. Um, um, at NW Conditioning there. Um, I'm trying to do a little bit more with the uh, change direction and uh, agility stuff at the moment. So I've just set up an Instagram uh, page of uh, at agility coach. Um, uh, and, you know, you direct message me on Twitter. It's, um, it's easy enough. Um, I'll do my best to get back in touch as long as there's no machine learning questions. That's <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. And that's, Neil, that's um, yeah. <laughs> Um, obviously, um, Sports Edge Clinic have their um, annual conference coming up in, in November. Um, where can our listeners find out a little bit more information about that if they're interested in attending? Because I know it's online this year. It is. Yeah, obviously. Um, I don't know. I think Mother Nature is a necessity of invention, isn't it? I think, I think that's, a, that's a saying. So this is, this is the first time we've, we've kind of gone digital with it. And we've got um, uh, an excellent lineup, actually, over the course of, um, I think it's four days. Um, uh, and it's like to be honest, I think it's really good value for the um, for the the numbers of um, speakers that we that we have and the, and the quality we have. But um, if you follow SSC Sports Medicine on Twitter, that's the easiest place. If you look at all the the late the, the last posts, it's got all the uh, the clinical sessions. I think the videos are going to be available for six weeks after um, to be able to pick up as well. Um, but it's just going to be there's going to be loads of content. It's it's the first um, fully uh, uh, digital whole conference we've done. Um, we spent a bit of time during during COVID um, uh, doing smaller uh, smaller conferences and, and CPD for, for GPs over in Dublin. So um, we've done a bit of learning from that. So hopefully it's going to go seamlessly. Um, but it should be um, it should be a really good event. And I, I know you guys are helping out with the, the sponsorship of that as well. So, so so thanks very much for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I think James, if, if you haven't got any further questions, and Neil, you haven't got anything further to add. Um, we'll, we'll call it a day there so Neil thank you again for your time we really do appreciate it um, and for those of you listening in um, if you want to learn more about um, Sports Surgery Clinic then as Neil says head over to, to Twitter head over to the website and, and dive into that information if you want to learn more about I Measure You and I Measure You Step um, please head to our website um, follow us on YouTube and also check out the IMU Academy there's loads of good content on there all to do with inertial sensors and where we see that part of the industry going. So thank you, Neil. Thank you, Jane. Um, and we'll see you all again very soon.